Hi, my name is Ben and today we'll be looking at some must-have modules for the Subpunk Red Core system for Foundry Virtual Tabletop. Now these are some modules that I use myself in my games that I think are really compatible with the system and if you can configure them right you, you can probably get the, the most use out of them yourself. So I just want to walk through um, the method of installing modules from the uh, built-in Foundry module download system as well as sort of walking through a couple of the, these main modules. I'll be providing um, shortcut links down below in the description as well as in the video itself so if you want to skip to a particular module you can just skip to the correct one and I've just got it in alphabetical order just so I'm not playing favorites and with that let's uh, take a look so to install a module or once you're in your foundry system we just want to come to the add-on module section click install module it'll bring up a list of available packages which includes uh, lots of different modules that are available in uh, in the world at the moment what we can do here is search for a package name and the first one we're gonna be looking at today is gonna be called combat utility belt and we can see here, Combat Utility Belt, we'll click Install, give that a moment to download what we need. Now, if you are using a module that isn't exactly compatible with a, a version of Foundry that you're running, so you can see here I'm running 0.8.8, .8. it does say that there's a potential compatibility risk, 0.8.7. Um, I have found in my personal experience that uh, any minor version changes, so say 0.8.8 .8 to 0.8.7, this should be okay to play in your game but um, do keep in mind if you're doing something between major revision changes so 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 uh, it may not be compatible so you may just want to play around with it a little bit before you sort of you know chuck your plays into it but usually these minor versions are okay to deal with and then you can um, you can sort of play as you go so with this module installed what we can do now is we'll launch our game world and then we will actually activate the module Okay, so I've just loaded into my game world. What I want to do is we'll go to settings in the top right corner. We want to go to manage modules. We can see here that we have the module that we selected, Combat Utility Belt. It is not currently enabled, so it's not enabled by default. We want to click here, say yes, we want to enable this one, save module settings, and then the system will do a quick reload, and this module will now be available for our use. So what we're going to do to understand the features of Combat Utility Belt, or at least what we're going to be using for our purpose, is we want to just bring in a scene so we can take a look at the current settings that we have uh, straight out of the box, and then we can look at what this module will actually do for us. So what I'll do is I'll just bring us into a scene. Let's bring in the city streets from the companion pack. Leave everything as is. Save changes. Let's activate this scene, and let's just bring one of our characters down as well. Okay, so if we right click our character, we can see here that there's a assign status effects. And we can see here that these have all the, uh, what we call the built in status effects. Now a lot of these are, I guess you could say, uh, they, they try to be generic in, in nature, but you can see that a lot of them also potentially sort of come from a sort of a D and D style sort of status effects in terms of you know how they're impacted, how they're affected. Uh, what we want to do with this module is we're actually going to give ourselves the ability to bring in our own custom uh, status effects or conditions, and we're actually going to use those to match the conditions that are available in the core rulebook. So let's close out of this one, and what we want to do is we want to come back to the uh, the settings tab, but what I'll do is I'll just close out of the scene just so we're not distracted. And we'll come to the settings tab up here. Now what we want to do is we want to collect, uh, click under Combat Utility Belt. There's a CUB computer, which is essentially the computer that's going to allow us to change a few settings. We'll click this one to bring it up. We can see that it comes up with a custom window here. Select a gadget. We're going to go Enhanced Conditions. And we're going to say, yes, we want to link conditions to status icons. Uh, yes, we want to remove the default status effects. We don't want to use those out of the box. And we'll click save. It'll come up with a prompt saying we just have to keep in mind uh, some active effects if we're using them, but we're not using them at the moment. And we now have an option here called condition lab. Yeah, let's bring this one up. So we can see here uh, under this, we have the items that we looked at before, which are all the different status symbols at the moment. So we can see that these are all the ones that are available at the box. But what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna see if we can create our own status uh, icons or conditions that are actually gonna match the core rulebook. So what we're gonna do with this is we're going to um, either create them ourselves or we can run an import feature. So I'll actually provide in uh, the description below a link to what's essentially the modules import dot uh, json file and this is going to give us the framework of what we need just so we don't have to do all the, the heavy lifting ourselves uh, so what we can do is we can click import up here 
it'll say, hey, what file do you want? What we'll do is we'll reference the file that we have uh, that I'll provide to you as a link. And we can essentially just either select it, which will bring up the file explorer, which you can then upload to the server itself, or you can just drag and drop a file across. So what I'll do is I'll do that for the JSON file now. We'll click that. We can see that it's picked up the CUB uh, Cyberpunk uh, uh, JSON file, call condition map.json. We'll click import and that's brought this in at the moment. So it hasn't saved this yet, but we can see an example of what it has. And in this uh, example file that I'll provide, you can see that we've got a couple of the already default icons. So we're still using, say for example, the mortally wounded um, uh, status icons that are already built into the system. And we're actually going to be using some uh, third party um, PNG files, which are available as, as well. Now I would like to say a special thanks to the person that actually created these files. Uh, they are EVR hyphen on Reddit. I'm not sure if I had that name right, but um, thank you very much. Again, I'll make sure to link them in the description below to their original post that they had on Reddit a few months back. And they have uh, all these files available in terms of the uh, PNG files. Now there is something to note if you are going to go down the import path from this is that in the import file, I have left the default world name to cyberpunk hyphen red. If you're, if you've created your cyberpunk world under a different naming standard, you may need to manually modify the JSON file or come through to this uh, section and set the world's name correctly, just so that you can actually link to the location of the files in your directory. So if you do need to upload the files uh, from that download link, just make sure that you're putting it in a similar path to what I'm doing, or you can follow your own path. But in this example, I've done worlds, the world name that I've set, which for us is cyberpunk hyphen red, uh, the data folder, I've created a new folder called status icons and I've put all the uh, items or all the PNG files into that particular status icons folder. So with that, we can see here that we have a selection of the items that are available in the core rulebook. So we can see concussion, ready to action, cover prone, hidden grapple, as well as a few of the uh, special sort of uh, critical injuries as well. If we come down here a little bit further, crushed fingers, dismembered leg, dismembered arm, dismembered uh, hand. And that'll help us a little bit more once we go to a, um, a sort of a scene, we can actually set that for the characters just so it gives a bit more of a visual representation just to remind ourselves, oh, okay, this character has this critical injury or this character is impacted and, and so on. So what we'll do is we'll click save mapping. You can see that it says, yep, this one has been saved now. It's got this set to uh, other imported. We'll click close. Let's go back and uh, let's recreate a scene just so we can take a look at what that's gonna look like now. Bring our character down again. And we can see here, uh, it is now essentially um, changed the default options available to us from the original sort of built-in status icons to the ones that we have now uploaded. So we can see here, say that this character suffered a critical injury of a, say a spinal injury or a dismembered hand. We can just click this one here at the moment and we can see that this now gives them a status icon in the top left corner. Now at the moment, in terms of the functionality that we're putting into this uh, from the third party module, it doesn't have any impact on their ability to make roles or impact their ability, you know, in terms of um, their attributes or their, their skills. But this is more just a visual indicator for those of you that want to have a visual indicator for any um, you know, abilities or any problems that they have. So we don't have that functionality in the system, but if you did want to play around with it, you could uh, look into a little bit further what combat utility um, belt has. And if you wanted to sort of apply some triggers, you can also look into that as well, but I won't cover that for this video. Um, now with that, let's move on to the next module. Next up in the module list is Dice So Nice. So if you're just getting started in the Foundry system, you may not have heard of this module, but it is very popular with um, people that, that have sort of taken on the system. So um, I'm just gonna sort of showcase a few of the features that Dice So Nice has out of the box and um, how it can work quite well with the Cyberpunk system, especially for critical roles. So what we'll do first is we wanna go and um, similar to what we did with the first module is we wanna make sure we have it enabled. So I've already gone through the um, setup configuration. I've already downloaded Dice So Nice and and now we're just going to save the module settings, have this refresh for just a moment. Um, the first time that you install it, it will say, hey, look, you can configure your my dice, setting, uh, my dice settings here as a sort of like a little chat window, but you can also configure them at any time by going to the module settings. So we won't click this one for the time being, we'll actually go through the window. So let's go to settings, we'll go to configure settings, we'll go to module settings. And then if we scroll down, we can see here that this is also in alphabetical order. So the first one was combat utility belt, second is now dice, so nice. 
So what we'll do is we'll go in my, my dice settings and then we can see here that it's de defaulted to some purple dice. And we can actually set, um, if we want, we can set individual die if we want to do uh, particular colors for different die. So say, you know, we wanted to have um, a particular color scheme for a D6 and a particular color scheme for a D10, we can just have everything set globally. So they have a few presets which uh, which work quite well as well. So we can say, yep, we just want to, oh, well, there you go. So that's really nice. So some spectrum colors, that's really cool. Uh, we just want to do sort of default foundry colors. We can also do this if we want to change the look of the D6s. We can see, do that if we want sort of black dots. Let's just do standard for that. Let's say we want to change up the textures, go for some nice fire, change up the material. If we want to get a bit of a, maybe like a glossy sort of look. Wow, that's pretty, uh, pretty full on. We can go the dice color. So let's say we want to go red for subpunk red. Yep, looking better. Uh, outline, let's maybe make that a dark red. Uh, edge color as well. Let's go darker, darker red. Yeah, that's looking better. So what we can do, just so we can see what it looks like, is we can just do a test roll, which will appear on the page. So that has all the dice and we can see what they look like here. Yep, not too bad. Um, now what we want to do is, let's just save this for now. I'll come back into this for a moment. We want to set up what we call uh, special effects. So if we come to special effects, what we want to do is because the uh, system has some uh, sort of, what would, I guess you'd call um, um, you know, special features from rolling either a a 1 or a 10 on a d10, we can set up some um, special effects here so that if you roll a critical, then we can actually have some special effects play when it re-rolls the, the next die. So what we'll do is we'll click the little plus button here. We'll say, okay, for a dice uh, type of a d10, if we roll, say, a 10, what effect do we want to give it? So it has a few out of the box. Let's say that we want a white glow for a d10 because that was a successful um, critical roll. And then we'll also do the same thing with a D10. On a one, and let's say darkness. So again, we may have to keep rolling until we actually get what we want. So what I'll do is I'll just click save here, click save changes. Let's try rolling a couple of times. Hopefully we get lucky in the next couple of dice, almost. Almost, oh jeez. Ah, okay, so that was a perfect example of a one and that's also re-rolled, um, or that, that's rolled an additional that we could see there. Let's see if we can actually get a 10 as well. 10% chance. very likely going to take me a while to actually get this. Well, we have another example of one, which is great. Ah, excellent. So we can see that glowed white as well when it re-rolled the uh, additional dice. So that's just a quick example of what you can use with Dice and Ice, just to add a little bit more flair, especially if you're playing with people remotely, which a lot of people in Foundry Virtual Tabletop do, just lets you, you know, get a bit more of a physical feel of actually watching the dice roll. And you'll actually notice that the card doesn't appear until after the Dice and Ice uh, module has done its thing. So we roll this, we wait for it to roll, and then it appears with the roll card as well. So it ties really nicely into the system. Um, anytime, if you do want to go through the module settings just to play around with a little bit further, they do have quite a few settings that you can take a look at. Also players themselves can come in and do the exact same thing with the dice. So each player can make their own dice or their own dice color. Um, you can also, I think in the latest version, if you want to do it between game systems or between um, different servers, you can also make a backup of the dice that you like and you can actually move them around as well. So that's just another example of uh, a great functionality in Dice and Ice. Uh, next up is Floating Combat Toolbox.
So floating combat toolbox is probably going to be a little bit more advanced for some of you that are maybe just starting out in Foundry Virtual Tabletop or just starting out in the system, but I thought it definitely deserved a bit of a review uh, just to see what functionality you might be able to use it with. So uh, what we're going to be using with this is um, um, built into Foundry at the moment as of 0.8.8, there's no functionality to actually have combat across scenes, which can make it a little bit difficult if you're doing something between scenes, say you've got you know characters in one scene that are trying to get to the next scene, or um, you potentially have say may maybe a layered approach, you've got multiple floors in a building, or say you've got a net runner within a net architecture, and then you've also trying to manage combat in another scene as well. So Floating Combat Toolbox actually, as of time of recording, probably came out only a few days ago, but it's a really great functionality that uh, works pretty much perfectly for managing combat across scenes. So what we'll do is we'll enable this first, let it refresh itself, and what we're going to do is we're actually going to create a account, an encounter by clicking the plus icon here. Uh, it's going to prompt us here whether we want to do a single scene or a multi-scene. You can change this in these settings if you wanted to always do a multi-scene. I do believe it's here under our configure settings, module settings, if we come down to floating combat toolbox, it'll say, you just got a couple of options, um, whether we wanted to always be floating combat by default, as well as a few others, which I won't go into here at the moment. But what we can do uh, with this scene is we want to select the characters that we want to be a part of this combat encounter. So say we have these two characters in the city street scene, we'll right click them, click this toggle, toggle combat state to add them into combat. You can see here that it's referencing the, the scene that they're on as well, the Sophian City Streets. I'll deselect these for the time being. We'll come over to the City Junction scene. We have two more characters, so let's say that they're they're maybe about, you know, they're sort of west of Red Eye and they're trying to get to Red Eye's location. What we can also do is we can select these two. So hold shift, right click, also click toggle combat state. And even with them being in a different scene, they're also going to be part of the combat as well. Now, this is going to come into play a, a little bit later on when I look at something like um, moving tokens between scenes using some functionality like multi-level tokens and everything like that. But this is just a quick example to show that you can have scenes using this module um, uh, function to have you know characters in one scene and they can also you know be a part of the combat as well uh, like I mentioned this will also be useful if you say have a net runner within that architecture but you also want them to be in initiative order so if you don't want to show which scene that the characters are in I do believe that there is a setting here somewhere let's take a quick look uh, total look display combat oh, okay here we go so let's disable that one for the time being save changes Excellent, all right. So we'll just keep track in terms of where our characters are between the scenes. We know that both Blaze and Spot are here in this scene. And in Dystopian City Streets, we can see that Red Eye and the Bodyguard are here as well. So once we actually start initiative order, which we could always do by having the characters roll here to kick it off, we'll know that uh, we can actually transition between the scenes and uh, have the characters do what they need to to get back and, uh, back, back and forth. The next module, Forian's Quest Log, is, I guess you could say it's primarily was built for some systems, say, more D&D than um, Cyberpunk, but I find, uh, especially for my um, you know, game master purposes, it's actually a really great way to interact uh, with the players in terms of having them track quests, both, you know, quests that everyone is following along, or missions, or... Um, jobs, I guess, if you want to use sort of, um, you know, net, uh, sort of edge runner terminology. Um, but you can also have uh, players track their own personal quests as well. So what we'll do is we'll enable this module, save module settings, give this one a moment to refresh. And what we'll do if we come over to the journal entries tab is we've actually got a section here that's now that now says quest log. What this will do is it'll open up the quest log. And we can see here that we actually don't have any uh, quests at the moment. What we'll do is let's just have a quick one. So it's added this one in an inactive state, that's fine. What we can do is we want to set a quest, um, a sort of the quest giver, that'll just sort of, you know, link in the, the person that was given the quest. So let's say that Spot's given this one. We can drop them straight in. This one will say, okay, so we've got this character here. Let's do some editing. Let's just say, find family. And let's just say that Spot wants to find some family that was potentially lost or maybe kidnapped. Um, we can add a description here. Now this description is gonna be public to anyone that can view this quest. So let's just say, in the Badlands. And then you can uh, you can add more as you need to for, uh, for this particular purpose. Um, if you wanted to divide this under objectives as well, you could say add objective. 
So you could do this, say, for particular people, find Kara, find Sam, and so on and so forth as well. Um, so because this is inactive, I believe, uh, as well as there's been a new quest, the objectives themselves are hidden. So just in case you wanted to hide some objectives from the players uh, until they get to a particular point in the quest, once you want to actually show these to everyone, you can just click this one here as the GM, you can make them available. Another great function as well is rewards, which should work with our item companions as well. So let's say that at the end of this, once a spot finds their family, potentially, you know, as a part of this, they're rewarded with a particular item. Um, what we could do is we could go to the, say the gear companion pack. Let's say just as an example that they get a, um, a let's just say, a, you know, maybe they get a disposable cell phone just, to, just as, a, as an example. What we can do is uh, this has now dropped the item here that we have here. Again, it's in a, a state where it's hidden, but we can always click that to show it. And we can also lock it just to make sure that no one can actually try to uh, take the item before it's actually ready to go. What the player should be able to do with this uh, once the quest is actually complete is the player, if they want to, you can configure this, they can actually um, essentially grab the item they can actually take that into their inventory just by essentially picking up the item and dragging it into their character sheet now there are a, a few more options especially for a, a game master there's gm notes which only you as the gm uh can see so again this is going to be permission based based on what you're doing and there's also going to be a few options to manage the quest if you wanted to add some splash art in terms of having it appear on the main thing it i think it appears in the top right corner you can also do that as well uh, you can set some subquests. So if you want to do, say, for these objectives, has a particular subquest just to find Kara or just to find Sam, you could come here. You could say add a subquest. Oh, actually wants us to finish editing, which I suppose makes sense. Let's come back to that. Let's try that again. Ah, there we go. Excellent. So we could say this one is going to be, in particular, we could say this is going to be to find Kara. We'll save. Yep, that's done. So the quest is still inactive, but it is a sub quest of find family and that'll actually link us back to the main quest here, which we can see. Yep, excellent. And then we can actually see here both the main quest, find family, and then the sub quest are here as well. Now they're in an inactive state, but what we could do is we could set them here um, to in progress or available. So if you wanted to have it in, say, a system of having some jobs available in terms of, you know, hey, you, um, you know, your fixer has set up a job for you, they want you to go here, you can set it as available and then at any time the party could potentially come through and then they could actually accept the job. So let's say for this one, we're going to go set as available. This is now moved to an available state. We can see here um, that you can set this to uh, in progress or you can set it to inactive. So if they actually decide to take on the job, they can do this as well. Now, because this is say, this is Spot's personal quest, there should be an option here under, yep, under quest settings permissions, if we just want this to be for a particular user as well. Um, so I haven't actually added in any additional users at this uh, in this system at the moment, but if you create some users under user management, you can actually configure this on a permissions basis and have just say, you know, just the player that's playing as Spot for this example, only they can actually see their personal quests, just so the other players don't see it as well. But I find this is going to be a useful way for many GMs to um, track what quests they're providing to their players and also have the players interact a little bit further with what they're able to see and what they're able to track just so they understand uh, you know, where they're up to with their own quests or where they're up to as a group. And you can actually make sure that you're providing information in the description just so they can actually keep track of, uh, keep track of what they're doing. FX Master is a useful tool that allows you to add a little bit more to the scenes that you're working with. So once we enable the module, there's going to be an option here in the sort of options to us on the left hand side. We'll click Save Module Settings. We can see here that there's an effects control. There's some effects that you can essentially drop in. Uh, now, a lot of these are going to be more D&D based than sort of something useful for cyberpunk or something that's sort of like sci-fi, but you may be able to find use out of it. Um, so you can see here the smoke bomb, fire cone, fireball, blood spur, acid. But what I like to use for my games is I actually like to use the uh, weather controls. So we can see here that we can actually add some control. So let's say that these characters are out and about, you know, they're in a shopping market or something like that. But let's just say that there's some uh, rain that's happening in, in Night City at the moment. What we can do is we can click this one to activate it and we can click Save Changes. 
and just like that we can see that it's it's just essentially dropping some rain down on us and, and you know just adding that little bit extra to the scene itself now um, if you are a fan of cyberpunk uh, you may know that in the time of the red in 2045 that there is some crazy weather sometimes that can affect night city itself so let's take a look at what options we might be able to do with that just to make things a little bit more interesting so i'll turn off the rain first come back to weather settings Let's say maybe that we want like a, a like a red fog that's coming through Night City. What we'll do is let's just say this, we'll say like a nice red color. Let's do this and let's save changes and let's see what that looks like. Hopefully it's not going to be too much, but we can see, you know, maybe it's like a sort of a red haze has come through and sort of wipe its way through the city. Now if that's too much for us, which it is a little strong. Let's see, so we've got a density scale, which we might be able to drop down. So let's maybe try 30 and see what that looks like. So the scale for what we set, we can also set a speed if we want to increase it. And so we can see that it's now transitioning a little bit more quickly. So we can also reduce that too if we wanted to make it a little bit more sort of, um, you know, a little bit more lighter. Oh, there we go. So it's actually taken effect and it's sort of reduced the fog a little bit more. Uh, so it looks like you get sort of just like sort of like a backgroundy sort of sort of color, just just sort of you know fading away. But um, there's a quite a few sort of useful built-in systems. Again, like I mentioned, this is more, you know, sort of um, catered towards a sort of like a D and D sort of game. But I, I found quite a quite a lot of use, um, sort of straight out of the box in terms of adding this to the game, just to sort of add some, you know, add some rain scenes just like that, just to add a little bit more flair to the uh, to the game itself. So definitely take a look into this. There may be some additional features that you can add into the module. But so for something like this, just adding a little bit of rain or adding a little bit of fog to the scene, it's really handy for uh, handy for what you're after. Multi-level tokens is a useful module for uh, settings where you have uh, sort of you know uh, travel or transportation between different scenes. So if you have a scene where you want a, a, your players to be able to walk through a door or walk through an elevator or a lift or something that transitions them between a scene, you can actually do this automatically with the multi-level tokens module, uh, which we'll set up. So let's firstly just enable this one and save and refresh. Now for these uh, two maps I'm going to be using here for this particular module, uh, they're courtesy of Frag Maps. I'll link their Patreon down below. I definitely recommend checking them out. They have some great cyberpunk themed uh, maps that you can utilize. So what we'll be doing here is we can see here that we're in like a city market square. And, and specifically what we want to do here is we can see that there's um, some stairs that lead down to a subway station. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to link this in such a way that we can do this. So what we'll do is with the module installed, we actually want to go to the drawing tools option. And let's say that we want to draw a rectangle. Um, now I've lined up the grid uh, with this so that we can have essentially uh, almost like a six uh, grid square, uh, sorry, a six sort of grid rectangle around this. And then any uh, characters that walk into this particular uh, grid, they'll actually be able to transport to the next scene. So what we can do here is if we select this, it'll sort of automatically go to cover the six grids that we want. Uh, double left click. And we have here another option in the drawing configuration tool called multi-level. What we want to do is because this is going to be both an in and an out teleporter, uh, we'll click here under teleports. We want to go in and out, and then it, it prompts us, hey, what do you want the teleport identifier to be? Now, this is just a unique name that's going to link both this drawing item as well as the other drawing item. So let's say that we want to say subway stairs and we'll scroll down we can keep everything as is we don't really want to change anything for the time being uh snap to grid just means that it means that the token will be snapped to the grid or as close as possible when they come out of the teleporter we don't want to clone them or anything like that uh, we don't want to do any macro triggers or anything we don't want to change any levels just for this because we're changing between scenes but that is a bit more of an advanced configuration if you wanted them to be able to move up on levels but there's a lot more on their uh, page for the particular module in question so let's just copy this so just we have this as a reference Come here, we'll go update drawing. We can see here that it has a name now of subway stairs. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to another scene and we're gonna create another drawing tool as well. So let's go to station. We'll activate this just so that we can see what we're after. So we can see here that we have a subway station that's potentially below the uh, below the area that we're after. Now, just for this, just as an example, let's just say that the stairs that were up above have come down to here, and then these stairs lead down into the subway station. So similar to what we did before, let's just say that if anybody walks on these, uh, let's just say, maybe let's just say these two tokens here or uh, further, they'll actually get teleported back up to the scene above. So what we can do here is we'll draw the rectangle, let's say for these two grids here, left click, 
multi-level or say in and out so they can go both ways paste so we'll have the same teleport identifier snap to grid is fine leave everything as is update the drawing and that's now ready to go now uh, as a GM if you're moving tokens between scenes you'll see things a little bit differently to your players so for this example what I'll be doing is I'll be showing you what it looks like as a player so let's go back and let's activate the Market Street scene first and I'll just bring up my player window just so we can see what the player will see so we can see here that we have the Market Street activated but the player will actually be able to um, navigate in the station scene as a part of what we're doing here even though this is still an activated scene so let's just bring up my window for the uh, player so yep we're logged in as red eye as a player so this is through just a sort of local uh, local window uh, now what we can see here is the player doesn't have the ability to see that this is a like a transportable uh, section so we could always put something on the map to try and indicate you know hey this will actually transport you to a scene but for example what we'll do is we'll just have the character walk up and they're instantly teleported to the station map that we can see here so that the character can now come down they can do what they want in this scene and you can still see that this is still the active scene up here in the top left hand corner but this character this player can actually come in and they can actually do whatever they need to within this scene now likewise if we have them come back up again so like we set up before it's going to be anything in these two grid areas it'll teleport them and it's actually teleported them back up to the uh, top map that they were on before simple as that so there are a few advanced modules if you were looking to get into this in terms of configuring them between different levels or something where you know there's multiple floors or something like that I didn't want to cover too much in this video I'm also just showing you that what you could potentially achieve with this as well um, another thing potentially if you wanted to do this if you wanted to trigger it you could actually do this with a map note so there's actually a reference here if we select the item uh, activate via map note so if there's actually a map note in the uh, drawing circle when you do it. If you actually click the map note, that'll activate it. So if you want to stop your players from, you know, traveling too far in some scenes, you can actually put a map note in. And then when you click it or someone that owns the map note clicks it, then they actually get teleported just to stop them from, um, from traveling too far between your scenes. But definitely check out a few of the advanced features that are available in this module. It's, it's definitely uh, very useful, but you might find that that's useful for letting your players navigate between scenes. Parallaxia is a great module for uh, settings where you want to have a dynamic background. So um, in this example, I'm going to show you here that we have something that what we could call is tileable or repeatable in terms of a background. And then with that background, we can actually repeat a background sort of um, over and over again, just to have it sort of appear as though it's moving. So what we'll do is we'll click uh, Parallaxia just to enable this one, save the module settings. And what we want to do is we want to set up a scene uh, in such a way that we can have a background actually rotate. Now with how our Foundry system works is we can't set the uh, background image directly in the background image option here because what we want to do is Parallaxia does things at a token level. So we just want to set the dimensions for the image that we're using uh, as appropriate. So for this, in, in this example, I've set the width and height based on the file that I want to use or the token image that I want to use. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this down as a token and then we can actually edit it further. So I'll come here, I'll go to the uh, folder that I have I've got here a uh, tunnel tileable BG. And again, this is uh, courtesy of Frag Maps. Uh, if we can drag this on, now it's gonna be a little bit tricky because the map is a little larger than, um, or the map is essentially the same size as the tile. Let's try and get this in the right spot. There we go. We just wanna position this in such a way that it's not going to be uh, going over anything. That looks good to me. Let's make sure that's good on the other side. Let's close this. Let's go to the actor. Make sure it's good on the left. Excellent. All right, that looks good. What we'll do is we'll go to the tile controls. We'll select this one, we'll right click it. There's going to be an option here for the tile which says to make Parallaxia tile. Let's left click that one. And automatically we can see that it's actually started to transition from left to right. Um, now, this is a little bit too slow for my liking. Um, so, what we'll do is we'll actually speed this up. So, what we can do is we'll go to um, tile controls again, we'll double left click the tile. It'll have some tile parameters, which are actually all the Parallaxia uh, settings. We can see here the width and the height is the same width and height of the background that we set. So that's why this looks um, this, this looks to be about the right size. There's sort of no cutoff or anything like that. If we come down here, what we can do is we've got an offset, which is set to minus 50. This is actually going to be the speed in which it's, it's actually traveling along 
um, you know, sort of going to the left of the screen here. So if we actually jump this up, let's just add another zero and click save. We can see that that's now uh, sped up. So we can see that's looking a little bit better. And if we wanted to do it again, double left click it. Let's maybe jump that up to a thousand. Bingo, very nice. So we can see that there's a nice moving background. Now this can be useful for situations or with um, token assets that are laid to have um, you know, sort of like a background image like this and then have something on top of it. So I'm just gonna slow this down because it looks like it might interrupt the video a little bit or at least might um, distract things a little bit too much. So what I'll do is let's just drop this back down a little bit, back to 500. That's a little bit better. And what we'll do is we'll actually drop on some items as well to, to showcase how this can be used for say like having a background moving while you're a, well, sort of, you know, while you're in a vehicle. Um, so I'm going to be using some of Fragmaps' um, sort of uh, train module assets. So let's just say that we want to add in, let's say we'll start with a dining room in the middle. Let's say we want to jump in a cargo as well. Give the front of the train as well, turn in the cockpit. Okay, now this is just a quick example. Now I may even be having this <laughs> going the wrong way. So you can see here that the train is here, but you can actually see that the background is going the other direction. Uh, what we can try here is if we double left click the token, remove the minus. That looks a little bit better to me. Let's take a look. Yep. All right. Now we can actually feel like the uh, we can actually feel like the train is going in the right direction, just like that. So Parallaxia is useful for these situations where you want it to have a feeling like there's a background moving. Um, definitely, you know, uh, there's definitely quite a few contributors to the community in terms of maps that can be tileable or can be repeatable. So definitely, um, definitely try and check that out. Usually they'll they'll mention or they'll have reference, you know, that this is a repeatable or a sort of a tileable asset. And then in those situations, you can have it in such a way that you can just essentially drop it in, have it repeat, play around with the para uh, Parallaxia settings like this, and you can have something just like this. Now this is also quite useful with this situation as well, especially in Foundry 0.8 systems, because you can also add in tokens above and use the built-in overhead tile option. So say we wanted to chuck something onto these, uh, let's just chuck in the actual top bits. So we've got a cockpit roof here. Let's just grab the actual car roofs. We'll need two of those. Just copy this. Make sure we put them in the right spot. That looks pretty good to me. And what we can do here is if we uh, select the token, uh, double left click it, go to overhead. And we can say, yes, this is overhead. There's a few options that we wanted to fade, uh, always have it visible um, if we want it to block vision and lighting or um, have it radial if we want it to surround a token, but we can just leave this as fade for the time being. We can update tile. We can actually see from this perspective, we can see the bottom tile as well as the one that's above it. And that's applicable for all tiles as well. Now this is actually a built-in function within Foundry Virtual Tabletop, but I just wanted to showcase this as well because you might find it useful for these sort of maps where you want players to walk around. Now, if you have a character that you're actually putting into this scene as well, from their perspective, uh, once they're actually in that section that has an overhead map, you'll actually notice that they don't see it above them until they transition to the next scene. So here we can see that they're in like a dining car, bring them across, and as soon as they transition into the next map, they'll actually switch, just like that. Which is, uh, which is brilliant. So that's uh, some great use that you can get out of the Parallaxia scene as well. There's a few other uh, maps that I have in my collection from a couple of Patreons, such as like desert maps or highway roads. And you'll also find that it has the same use as well that you can essentially have it repeating. And then you can have like, say like a car chase scene or something on like a, you know, so like a Badlands highway where you've got cars that are sitting as static images similar to the train. The train is a static image, but the background is actually moving. So it actually, you can actually feel like it's, uh, it's actually like transitioning between you sort of traveling to a, traveling to a destination. The next one we have is just called pings. Now there is a requirement with this module to install what's called settings extender, which pings utilizes. So if you try to install this, it'll tell you, hey, you need to install this dependency. It'll prompt you when you actually go to install the module from the settings as well. So that's fine. So just say, yes, I want to enable the module and its dependencies. Save module settings, give it a refresh. Give it a moment if it wants to play nice. Oh, let's just activate our scene. 
Uh, now, this is a very straightforward module because essentially it's gonna let us do one thing, which is gonna to be to ping the map. So if you have a map that you want to be able to showcase, hey, I want to you know check out something that's in a particular region, what you can do is you can just hold left click and then here it's actually gonna show, hey, look, you know this person under this name, which is based on the name that you set up in Foundry, they're pinging this location. Now, this is gonna utilize the colors that you have, which are built into Foundry as well. So what we do is we click the Game Master here in the bottom uh, right corner, right click, use the configuration. If you want to set the color to a particular color scheme, so let's say that we wanted to do a nice green, save configuration, that's also going to affect your left click ping as well. So uh, short and sweet, but it, it's very useful. It's not currently a functionality that's built into Foundry. So if you're coming from a different system, such as something like Roll20, and you just want to have the ability to ping, hey, you know, I'm looking here, this is where I want to go, or this is what I'm looking at, this is a very handy tool for uh, for what you're after. Quick Insert Search Widget also has some dependencies, just like ping. So what we'll do is we'll select Quick, quick Insert Search Widget. It'll say, hey, you need to install Keybind uh, LIB. So yep, that's fine. Save the module settings, let it refresh. Now, uh, I did showcase this in one of our earlier videos when we released the companion pack, but I also thought I'd mention this here because it's a very useful tool, is that uh, Quick Insert Search Widget allows you to essentially check uh, different packs and different settings that you have just in case you wanted to quickly add items in either actors or NPCs or items to add into inventories. So what we'll just do is we'll quickly just check the module settings just to make sure that everything looks okay. So we'll come down here right to the bottom of quick uh, insert search widget. We can see at the moment that the keybind that is set for this is open quick insert is control plus space. So what we'll do is let's say that we want to add in some items to our character. So let's bring up uh, Reno. We can see here that they have some gear, but let's say that we want to add in some more. What we'll do is I'll hold control and space. You can see the index has loaded successfully. And what it does is it has a search option for what we want to search. Now it's set to check the compendium packs automatically out of the box. What we could do is we could just say what we want. So let's say that we want, uh, let's say that we want to cry a pump just, just you know, first thing came in my head. So we'll go C, R, O, O. We can see here that it searched the gear options and it's given us a few options for what we want. It's also picked up a few keywords similar to what we had, but not exactly. So we can see here, so a crossbow, micro video from the cyberware companion packs, uh, crowbar, crossbow from the weapons packs, and then the gear that we're after. So let's say, let's just say cryo tank that we want to drop in this. We can just pick it up, drop it, brings it straight onto the character just like that. Uh, similar thing with um, our actors or NPCs if you wanted to bring them into the into the world as well. So let's say that we've got the hardened bodyguard or we've got characters here. We're quickly building a scene that we want to chuck together. You don't have time or you've got too many folders of different actors and NPCs. And similar what we'll do is we'll just control space. We could say that we want to bring in red eye. Just like that. And bingo, just like that. That's actually pulled down the actor from there. And instead of us having to fight through the, uh, the actor window, or let's just say that we're in a different window with some uh, some settings, we can just control space and just search exactly for what we want. Just like that. Um, nice and easy, but definitely recommend if you're also using data from the companion pack, just makes things a little bit easier for you. Now, if you're like me, I often find when I'm creating scenes for Cyberpunk, uh, I like some default set, and I like that to be applicable throughout the scenes that I create. So usually that, that depends on sort of like the size of the grid, or maybe I don't want to have sort of padding around the scene. Um, so what we can do is we'll enable the scene, uh, scene default module, and that'll actually give us an option to set what we want for a default scene. So we'll go here, configure settings, come down to module settings, right down the bottom, should have our scene defaults. It'll actually open up a window and this allows us to set the defaults of what we want for scenes. So say for example here, I don't like padding. Uh, I don't want to use padding. It's not something that I need for my games. I can see here it's set to 0 0.25. Set that to zero. Come right down the bottom, we'll click save changes. That's now set the scene defaults. Click save changes here. And if we come to here, we'll go create scene. Let's just say markets. We can actually see that it's picked up that I don't want padding percentage set anymore and it's actually using that default value. So this can be useful if you always wanted to have some default values. Um, also useful if you do or don't want to set token vision. So again, that's something if you choose not to use it for your games, that's something that you can do. But it's it's a very handy, you know, very quick tool just for making sure that um, whenever you're making a new map that you want something to be always set. So for me, that's always padding percentages. Um, that's just something that you can always use to uh, to just make your games and make creating your scenes just that little bit easier. 
Simple Calendar is a very uh, straightforward tool to allow you to, uh, to basically keep track of the uh, the, the time uh, that your characters are playing. So for example, for many characters that are going to exist in the Cyberpunk Red universe, they have to pay bills on a regular basis. A lot of the time that will be for where they're living, um, as well as the lifestyle costs. So they have to usually pay that on a monthly basis. So what we'll do is we'll enable the module. And we can see here that there's an option here under calendar. And this just lets us see what the time is at the moment. We can see the time, we can see the date. We can also configure a few additional settings for what we want. If we want it to be some sort of crazy calendar, you know, usually most of the time we want to set this to a particular value. Let's just have a look. So your settings, let's say that we want this to be in 2045. We can set up uh, additional settings that we want in terms of the, pre, uh, you know, the prefix, um, what the year zero is, what we want the behaviors to be for anything as well. If we want particular years, particular seasons, gives you a lot of flexibility for what you're after. We can set up default months if we want the months to be a little bit different. Again, for us in the Subpunk universe, we don't really have to worry too much about uh, this sort of stuff, but it does give you that flexibility if you wanted to change the, you know, change the details, change the days. Um, but it does give you that little bit extra flexibility in terms of what you're after. So click Save Changes, come back to this, and we can now see that we're in January 2045. So it has some time uh, controls here as well as day controls just in case we want to move forward in terms of the time frame. We can add notes. So if you know something uh, eventful happens on this day, we can add a note to the calendar just to say, hey, look, this happened at this time frame. Um, but this is just a handy tool just so we can make a note of, you know, once it gets to say the 1st of February, hey, look, your, uh, you know, your bills are due. Your characters need to pay their bills. So just another straightforward tool just so you can keep a track of what needs to happen. So let's say February 1st, 2045. Pay your bills. And let's just see, oh, we can actually repeat this monthly. There we go, perfect. So we'll do is we'll save the note. February 1st, 2045, you need to pay your bills. Um, and then that should also repeat every, uh, every month on the first day, just to make sure that the characters know, hey, you need to pay your bills. Um, so that's another quick uh, example, just so you can keep track of this within the Foundry system, just so you don't have to sort of, you know, keep track of this in Excel spreadsheet or anything like that. But again, it's, uh, it's just something handy that you can uh, try and use just to add a little bit more, uh, a little bit more of a sort of environment and a little bit of a, a little bit of, um, you know, extra sort of, um, you know, resources to your game just to, you know, make it that little bit uh, extra special. Now, for those of you that are potentially streaming or at least want to send some sound effects to your players as they're playing a game, uh, this next module, Soundboard by Blitz, is a very handy tool just for doing that. So what we'll do is we'll enable this, save the module settings, we'll come over to the uh, audio playlist tab, and we've actually got a open soundboard option. We can see here that there's a few options in terms of sound effects that we want to play. So there's a, a couple that are included out of the box, but it actually gives you the flexibility to include your own as well. Um, so I don't want to go too much into this in terms of all the features that are available, but you can also add in your own sound effects or at least point in the configuration where your sounds need to be. So if we go say to configure settings, module settings, right down the bottom will actually ask us, hey, look, you know, this is a custom soundboard directory. Uh, and we can actually set, you know, if we have our own uh, audio or our own sound effects that we're bringing in, such as, you know, gun noises, you know, pistol, shotgun, stuff like that, we can actually set that up in the configuration settings to say, hey, look, I want to play this music. Um, now, out of the box, again, this is sort of like, you know, D&D sort of esque music, but it gives us an example of the potential that we have using this module to add in our own um, sort of sound effects and everything like that. So we can see here, if we wanted to do an arrow hit stuff like that. So that just play just like that. Um, and, and you know, if we wanted to repeat it, you could also do that. You can also look at some additional settings if you wanted to repeat um, really regularly, if you wanted to save it. So it's a favorite sound just in case you had it, you know, quickly accessible. That's just another feature that you can, uh, you can look at as well. And that was just a uh, quick video, just trying to show off a couple of those really useful modules that I find useful in the Subpunk Raid system, and I hope that you do too. Uh, if you do like this, please feel free to share your thoughts and comments in terms of any modules that you use yourself that you think might be beneficial to other members in the community. Um, if you have any recommendations on future videos that you'd like to see as well, please do feel free to let me know. Uh, and also, don't forget to check out our GitLab and Discord links that are all link below as well, in case you wanted to join the Subpunk Raid community. Um, I will note again, uh, you know, this is a community uh, group that we do have in terms of the Subpunk Red core system. We're not affiliated with Arthur Sorian games themselves. So if you want to contribute, you want to uh, pitch in, potentially help us improve the system further, we're definitely uh, welcome your board.